Sholem Alechem was a novelist, essayist, playwright, and one of the great writers of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Born Sholem Nomovich Rabinovich, he created rich characters that stand out because of their humanity and their universal appeal. Like in this suspenseful, exciting tale called A Yom Kippur Scandal, read by David Eisner. <laughs> That's nothing, called out the man with round eyes like an ox, who had been sitting all this time in the corner by the window, smoking and listening to our stories of thefts, robberies, and expropriations. I'll tell you a story of a theft that took place in our town, in the synagogue itself, and on Yom Kippur at that. It's a story worth listening to. Our town, Kazorlevka, that's where I'm from, you know, is a, a small town and a poor one. There is no thievery there. No one steals anything for the simple reason that there's nobody to steal from and nothing worth stealing. And besides, a Jew is not a thief by nature. That is, well, he may be a thief, but not the sort who will climb through a window or attack you with a knife. He will divert, subvert, controvert, as a matter of course. But he won't pull anything out of his pocket. He won't be caught like a, a common thief and led through the streets with a yellow placard on his back. Imagine then, a theft taking place in Kazerlevka, and such a theft at that. 1,800 rubles at one crack. Here's how it happened. On Yom Kippur Eve, just before the evening services, a stranger arrived in our town, a salesman from some town in Lithuania. He left his bag at the inn and went forth immediately to look for a place of worship, and he came upon the old synagogue. Coming in just before the services began, he found the trustees around the collection plate. Sholem Aleichem, said he. Aleichem Sholem, they answered. Uh, where does our guest hail from? From Lithuania. And your name? Even your grandmother wouldn't know if I told her. But you have come to our synagogue. Where else should I go? Then you want to pray here? Can I help myself? What else can I do? Then put something into the plate. What did you think? That I wasn't going to pay? To make a long story short, our guest took out three silver rubles and put them in the plate. Then he put a ruble into the cantor's plate, one into the rabbi's, and one for the cheder, and threw half into the charity box. And then began to divide the money among the poor who flocked to the door. And in our town, we have so many poor people that if you really wanted to start giving, you could divide Rothschild's fortune among them. Impressed by his generosity, the men quickly found a place for him along the east wall. Where do you find room for him when all the places along the wall are occupied? Don't ask. Have you ever been at a celebration or a wedding or a circumcision when all the guests are already seated at the table and suddenly there's a commotion outside and the rich uncle has arrived? What do you do? You push, you shove, you squeeze until a place is made for the rich relative. Squeezing is a Jewish custom. If no one squeezes us, we squeeze each other. The man with eyes that bows like an ox paused, looked at the crowd to see what effect his wit had on us, and then went on. So, our guest went up to his place of honor and called to the shamus to bring him a praying stand. He put on his tallis and started to pray. And he prayed. And he prayed. Standing on his feet the whole time, he never sat down or left his place all evening long, all until the next day. To fast all day, standing on one's feet without ever sitting down, that only a Litvak can do. But when it was all over, when the final blast of the shofar had died down, the day of atonement had ended, and Chaim the Malamed, who had led every prayer from the beginning of Yom Kippur to time immemorial, had cleared his throat, and in his tremulous voice had already begun, Ma'ariv Arovim. Suddenly screams were heard. Help! 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 We looked around and the stranger was stretched out on the floor in a dead faint. We poured water on him and revived him, but he fainted again. What was the trouble? Plenty! This lit fact tells us that he had brought with him to Krasilevka 1,800 rubles. Well, to leave that much at the inn, think of it, 1,800 rubles, he had been afraid. Whom could he trust with such a sum of money in a strange town? And yet, to keep it in his pocket on Yom Kippur, uh, that was not exactly proper either. So, 
At last, his plan had occurred to him. He had taken the money to the synagogue and slipped it into the praying stand. Only a Litvak could think of a thing like that. Now do you see why he had not stepped away from the praying stand for a single minute? And yet, during one of the many prayers, when we all turned our face to the wall, someone must have stolen the money. Well, the, the, the poor man, he wept. He, he tore his hair, wrung his hands. What would he do with the money gone? It, it was not his own money, he said. He was only a clerk. The money was his employer's. He himself was a poor man with, with a house full of children. There was nothing left for him to do except go out and drown himself, and hang himself right there in front of everybody. Well, hearing these words, the crowd stood petrified, forgetting that they had been fasting since the night before until it was time to go home and eat. It was a disgrace before a stranger, a shame and a scandal in our own eyes. A theft like that, 1,800 rubles, and where? In the holiest of holies, in the old synagogue of Kazolevke. And on what day? On the holiest day of the year on Yom Kippur, such a thing had never, never been heard of before. Shamus, lock the door, order a rabbi. We have our own rabbi in Kazolevke, Rabbi Yosefil, a true man of God, a holy man. Not too sharp-witted, perhaps, but a good man, a man with no bitterness in him. Sometimes he gets ideas that you would not hit upon if you had 18 heads on your shoulders. Well, when the door was locked, Rabbi Yosef turned to his congregation, his face pale as death, his hands trembling, his, his eyes burning with a strange fire. He said, listen to me, my friends. This, this is an ugly thing, a thing unheard of since the world was created, that here, in Kazralevka, there would be a sinner with a renegade to his people. He would have the audacity to take from a stranger, a poor man with a family, a fortune like this. And on what day? On the holiest day of the year? On Yom Kippur? And perhaps on the last, most solemn moment, just before the shofar was blown. Such a thing has never happened anywhere, and I cannot believe it is possible. It simply cannot be. But perhaps... Who knows? Man is greedy. And the temptation, especially with a sum like this, 1,800 rubles, God forbid is great enough. So, if one of us was tempted, if he were fated to commit this evil on a day like this, we must probe the matter thoroughly, strike at the root of this whole affair. Heaven and earth have sworn that the truth must always rise as oil upon the waters. Therefore, my friends, let us search each other now, go through each other's garments, shake out our pockets, all of us, from the oldest householder to the shamus, not leaving anyone out. Start with me. Search my pockets first. Thus spoke Reb Yosef, and he was the first to unbind his garbadine and turn his pockets inside out. And following his example, all the men loosened their girdles and, and showed the linings of their pockets too. They searched each other, they felt and shook one another until they came to Lazar Yossel, who turned all colors and began to argue that, in the first place, the, the stranger was a swindler and, and, and his story was, was pure fabrication of a Litvak. No one had stolen any money from him. Couldn't they see that it was all a falsehood and a lie? The congregation began to clamor and shout, what did he mean by this? All the important men had allowed themselves to be searched, so why should Lazar Yossel escape? There, there are no privileged characters here. Search him. Search him, the crowd roared. Lazar Yossel saw that it was hopeless and began to plead for mercy with tears in his eyes. He begged them not to search him. He swore by all that was holy that he was as innocent in this as he would want to be of any wrongdoing as long as he lived. Then why didn't he want to be searched? It was a disgrace to him, he said. He begged them to, to, to have pity on his youth, to not bring this disgrace down on him. Uh, do anything you wish with me, he said, but uh, don't, don't touch my pockets. How do you like that? Do you suppose we listen to him? But wait, I forgot to tell you who this lazy Yossel was. He was not a Krasilevsky. He himself came from devil knows where at the time of his marriage, to live with his wife's parents. The, the rich man of our town had dug him up somewhere for his daughter, boasted that he had found a, a rare nugget, a, a fitting match for a daughter like his. 
He knew a thousand pages of Talmud by heart and all of the Bible. He was a master of Hebrew, arithmetic, bookkeeping, algebra, penmanship, in short, everything you can think of. When he arrived in Kreslevke, this jewel of a young man, everyone came out to gaze at him. What sort of bargain had the rich man picked out? Well, to look at him, you could tell nothing. He was a, a young man, something in trousers, not bad looking, but with a nose a trifle too long, eyes that burn like two coals, and a sharp tongue. Our leading citizens began to work on him, tried him out on a page of Gemara, a chapter of scriptures, a, a bit of Rambam, this and, and the other. He was perfect at everything, the dog. Whenever you went after him, he was at home. Reb Yosel himself said that he could have been a rabbi in any congregation. As for world affairs, there is nothing to talk about. We have an authority on such things in our town, Zeidel Ramshays, but he could not hold a candle to Lazer Yosel. And when it came to chess, there was no one like him in all the world. Talk about versatile people. Naturally, the whole town envied the rich man his find, but some of them felt he was just a little too good to be true. He was too clever. And too much of anything is bad. For a man of his station, he was too free and easy, a hail fellow well met, too familiar with all the young folk, boys and girls, and maybe even loose women. There were rumors, and at the same time, he went around alone too much, deep in thought. At the synagogue, he came in last, put on his tullus with his skull cap on askew, thumbed aimlessly through his prayer book without ever following the services. No one ever saw him doing anything exactly wrong, and yet people murmured that he was not a God-fearing man. Apparently a man cannot be perfect. And so, when his turn came to be searched and he refused to let them do it, that was all the proof that most of the men needed that he was the one who had taken the money. He begged them to let him swear on any oath he wished, begged them to, to, to chop him, roast him, cut him up, do anything but shake his pockets out. At this point, even Rabbi Reb Yosefil, although he was a man we had never seen angry, lost his temper and started to shout, You, th he cried, you thus and thus? Do you know what you deserve? You see what all these men have endured? They were able to forget the disgrace and allow themselves to be searched. But you want to be the only exception. God in heaven, either confess and hand over the money, or let us see for ourselves what is in your pockets. You are trifling now with the entire Jewish community. Do you know what they can do to you? To make a long story short, the men took hold of this young upstart threw him down on the floor with force and began to search him all over, shake out every one of his pockets, and finally they shook out. Well, guess what? A couple of well-gnawed chicken bones and a few dozen plump pits still moist from the chewing. You can imagine what impression this made to discover food in the pockets of our prodigy on this holiest of fast days. Can you imagine the look on the young man's face and on his father-in-law's and on poor Rabbi, poor Reb Yosefo? He turned away in shame. He could not look anyone in the face on Yom Kippur in this synagogue. As far as the rest of us, hungry as we were, we couldn't stop talking about it all the way home. We rolled with laughter in the streets. Only Reb Yosefo walked home alone, his head bowed full of grief, unable to look anyone in the eyes, as though the bones had been shaken out of his own pockets. The story was apparently over. Unconcerned, the man with the round eyes of an ox turned back to the window and resumed smoking. Well, we all asked in one voice, what about the money? What money? asked the man innocently, watching the smoke he had exhaled. What do you mean? What money? The 1,800 rubles. Oh, he drawled. The 1,800. They were gone. Gone? Gone forever. 